Great. All right. I'm Barbara Garrity Blake, and I am talking to Mr. Jess Hawkins here at his home in Moorhead City. It is October 7th. 2016, and this is the um, Sea Grant Fisheries Reform Act Oral History Project. So thank you, Jess, for agreeing to do this. You're welcome. So Jess, um, for those listeners who have no idea who you are, can you just start off by um, telling me where you grew up and how you came to be involved in fisheries? I'll be glad to. Um, I was born and raised in a little town called Bath. Uh, which is north of here in Moorhead City, and uh, it's our oldest town in our state. And I grew up um, fishing and hunting and had a love for uh, uh, outdoors life and fish, and so went to school to become a marine biologist. And so I um, ended up working for what's called the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries, and I was a fisheries biologist or marine biologist with them. And, Started a career working in uh, a town called the original Washington, Little Washington, and uh, worked there for some years and uh, was transferred down to Moorhead City and became uh, less of a field biologist versus an administrator and worked there the final 15, 16 years of my career here in Moorhead City. Uh, the last part of my career, I was a, uh, it's called the Marine Fisheries Commission Liaison, and Marine Fisheries Commission makes the the laws or the rules for the state of North Carolina concerning coastal fisheries. And uh, uh, I was that contact person for the division and that commission. And uh, that's how I became involved in the Fisheries Reform Act is that um, uh, the Fisheries Reform Act addressed um, or reorganized the commission and, and empowered the commission with different duties. And so I was uh, uh, fortunately involved in the development uh, of of the Fishery Reform Act and the study, which was called the Moratorium Steering Committee, which studied uh, how to reorganize uh, the governance structure for um, managing coastal fisheries in North Carolina. Okay, well, can you tell us what was going on in the mid-1990s to even bring about this effort? Yeah, and actually, I started my career in a division in 1978, and uh, as interest in fisheries, uh, let me back up a little bit, is fisheries in North Carolina are very um, important to the cultural fabric of the, of the uh, state, and they're very important economically. And then, of course, they're, uh, we're a unique state biologically. We have a lot of uh, different types of fish species. We have the largest estuary in our state, so there were uh, a lot of fisheries issues were starting to come to the forefront in the late 70s and 80s. And the way the uh, division dealt with them, I, I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to work for nine directors for the Division of Marine Fisheries. And the Division of Marine Fisheries is a scientific arm or, or the management arm. Uh, they also enforce the rules that the commission passes. Um, uh, the division, uh, like I said, was going through directors uh, pretty frequently because the issues were very intense and the issues were complex in some cases. And so in the, in the 80s, uh, we had a lot of issues coming to the forefront and um, uh, we were uh, going through directors pretty, pretty well. The commission was reorganized one time. The governor removed um, all the commission members. So a lot of contentious nature uh, um, between the in, people that were interested in the environment, people that were interested in commercial fishing, and somewhat to, uh, with recreational fishing. Recreational fishing really started, uh, uh, organized groups started coming together in the uh, 1990s, but in the 80s, uh, it was, uh, those issues came to a forefront, and we realized that uh, uh, we probably needed to come to a, uh, a different way of dealing with those issues, and maybe have a different structure. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you remember anything specifically that was going on that caused our um, governor and legislature to come together and say, okay, no more fishing licenses until we study this? Well, what happened is, is uh, we had, you know, leadership. Uh, again, I worked for nine directors and I worked for four governors and multiple, uh, I worked with multiple um, 
Marine Fisheries Commission chairman, and leadership is a uh, is a key thing. And and as you know, uh, Barbara, you know opportunities. Uh, if opportunity comes along, one has to be able to see that opportunity and try to seize it. And so. It was uh, like where we, we had a director that had a lot of experience and was had a, a very good heart. And then we had a chairman that also uh, did not know a lot about fisheries, but had strong leadership skills, in my opinion, and, uh, and wanted to make fisheries better in our state. So, uh, uh, and he had very strong political ties with the governor at the time, which was Governor James Hunt, Jim Hunt. And uh, he and the director decided that we just need to stop and take a breath. And so that's why they decided to put a, um, a freeze on the licenses. And this was in the 1990s. And the main issues that were going on then, uh, uh, Barbara, what I remember were Menhaden fishing. Uh, people, some of the folks were, um, uh, did not like the vision of seeing Menhaden boats off their ocean waters. Uh, some towns had passed some regulations banning gill nets, which they did not have the authority to do, and the council for the um, commission and the division informed them of that. So we had a whole series of issues. Our crab fishery was uh, uh, going on very strong, and uh, there were a lot of conflict and competition issues in that. We had a crab license at the time. We had a, a whole series of licenses, and, and uh, um, so those two leaders, uh, and of course the governor, and then of course then the general assembly, they were able to convince uh, that we needed to put a freeze on the licenses. And then those two leaders um, felt it'd be best to convene a group of people that had a uh, strong interest in our fisheries and how they were being uh, managed and the conservation of fish. And so uh, uh, they formed what's called a moratorium steering committee. And you were a part of that, as you know, and a lot of people I had to uh, the, I was blessed to be able to meet. Uh, they were on that committee and they met intensely uh, for two years and talking about the whole, every issue that uh, uh, our director, Dr. Bill Hogarth had heard, that the chairman had heard and these members of the Sorry. moratorium steering committee. Who was the chairman at the time? The chairman was uh, Bob Lucas. Oh, okay. Yep, so uh, yeah, and Bob Lucas uh, again realized very quickly uh, with his leadership, uh, in, again, in my opinion, humble opinion, is that uh, we needed to look at things a little bit differently because he, he, had, he had just had experience fishing recreationally, uh, but uh, he hadn't been involved in a lot of um, the uh, contentious issues that involve small scale fisheries and conflict between commercial fishermen. And, and, uh, and so uh, he thought it would be a good idea. And he developed a good friendship with a, a person named Jewel Wheatley who had owned uh, a, uh, uh, a Menhaden fishing uh, uh, company. And that was one of our largest fisheries, if not the largest fishery in our state for many, many, many years, as you know. And so, uh, um, uh, and then there were a whole series of other people in that moratorium steering, steering committee that had served on the commission, the Marine Fisheries Commission, uh, had had, in, had, had uh, experience with the Marine Fisheries Commission and the division. And uh, uh, so it was a great group of people. That was an unlikely friendship in a way between the commercial representative being Jewel Wheatley and then Bob Lucas, who's an attorney very, from upstate and a recreational fisherman. Very much so. Bob was from, um, uh, from the Selma area and, uh, and Jewel Wheatley had grown up here in Beaufort and was, his family is very, um, uh, very well known in the area. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, interesting, uh, uh, friendship that they developed and uh, and they again that's where I talk about leadership they had a vision and, and I'm sure Jewel I didn't know Jewel as well personally as a as I knew uh, Bob uh, uh, but uh, I'm sure he took a lot of criticism from the people he knew in the commercial fishing industry about the freeze on the licenses and about the things that were recommended so uh, it, it again it speaks to me it, uh, Jewel's involvement and his um, uh, his interest in trying to do something better speaks to his leadership ability. So yeah. Yep. So during the the process of the moratorium steering committee, what was that like for you? What were you doing? Oh, it was very exciting. Uh, well, I was doing. Uh, uh, I was acting Marine Fisheries Commission liaison as the state works. Uh, they weren't paying me for that, so. Uh, 
I was a district manager in Little Washington, on Washington, so I was doing two jobs and also being involved in this, uh, in these issues. Um, for better or worse, you know, um, um, uh, I think the strength of my abilities is to care and to, uh, uh, and to work hard to try to address things you care about. That was one of the reasons why I did not go to another state, uh, did not work on my, I probably should have gone and get my doctorate, but I wanted to stay here. And I, I stuck with the Division of Marine Fisheries. Uh, a lot of people that were hired with me, that were very, a lot more intelligent than me, they moved on to higher paying jobs and more um, uh, areas where they could publish their science. And, uh, and so I was one of the few that were left. And, uh, and I saw this as a wonderful opportunity and Dr. Hogarth or Bill uh, saw that because he, he allowed me freedom to work on that. And, and then Bob saw that and he asked uh, uh, Lucas, I mean Lucas, Bob asked Bill could I serve as an MFC liaison. There was no position to that, to that ability and he wanted someone that the commission could contact daily and deal with the issues, so I was right in the middle of all of it. It was, uh, thank the Lord I was younger at the time, because uh, you had, um, I did have a family, uh, and you're trying to balance all that, but it required a lot of travel. As you know, you went to a lot of meetings, and, and it required uh, keeping up with what, they had various subcommittees, and I was fortunate I knew the chairs of each of those subcommittees, and I knew a little bit about um, a lot of the issue. I knew a little bit about the issues they were dealing with, which were extensive, and um, I had freedom to give input to a lot of those people. And uh, uh, I guess they uh, respected my input because a lot of those ideas were incorporated. And uh, so it was a very exciting time because you felt like you were making your state a better state and you were trying to do something to make it better for the people that utilize the resource, both for recreational commercial fishermen, make it better for the fish and make it better for the stack taxpayers and having a fair and accountable system to manage those resources. Yeah, so here we are 20 years later. Um, Fisheries Reform Act was passed in 1997. Time flies. It does. So, and I'm retired, thank the Lord. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. But I'm too old for that. The Fisheries Reform Act to me was very much, in a way, um, you were so central through the whole thing, not only the moratorium process, but the results of the Fisheries Reform Act and the legislation and the restructuring of how we manage our fisheries, you continue to be the liaison between the commission and the division. So they actually turned it into a job where I got paid for it. So that was uh, unusual for the state. So uh, Dr. Hogarth unfortunately moved on uh, and uh, we had a new director, but uh, and, and we had an acting director during some time. But I, I was able, had the honor to work very closely with Bob and all the commissioners. You know, it reduced the commission from 17 to nine, and so I I would communicate daily with the chairman. I'd give him an update, and then I communicated at least weekly with all the commissioners, uh, and it created a uh, an input structure for the commission, all these advisory committees. And so uh, you had regional, four regional advisory committees. You had four standing subject committees, which uh, they were based on like finfish and cre uh, shellfish and crustacean and water quality. And uh, uh, so what happened is that study was proposed at a general assembly and, uh, and um, uh, Bob was able to uh, help navigate that through the General Assembly, as was other people that had political connections, such as Jewel and other people on the moratorium, and it pretty much got uh, the whole fit, the whole moratorium steering committee uh, recommendations. All of them got implemented except the saltwater license, which was very, very, very unusual. And uh, the Senate Senate leadership at the time, uh, Doctor, I mean uh, Senator Mark Bass Knight, was very, very powerful uh, political leader in our state. Uh, you know he. Um, uh, his constituents and he felt it would be good for our state, as did the governor, as did the Speaker of the House, and uh, so it all got passed except the saltwater license, and, uh, and they gave the commission the ability to study that more to try to get that implemented, and then later on uh, that also got passed several years later. So, uh, so the whole, 
I'd be willing to say almost all of the proposals by the moratorium steering committee were implemented by legislation, which was so exciting because you had uh, some of the politicians that I worked with, they talked about a new day when new governors would come in and, and this was indeed a new day. And you had nine commissioners, there were slots assigned to the commissioners, you had uh, where three of them would be with the commercial, representing the commercial sector, three were recreational sector, two at large, and one scientist, so it was meant to be where nobody could dominate, uh, no one group could dominate the commission. We had a lot of debate about the number, nine seemed to be a, a, a functional number where you'd have adequate input, and then you had all these advisors that we got to develop a process and create from ground zero because um, in some cases, chairmen of the commission, they had the ability to have advisory committees, but they might meet once a year based on a crisis or based on an issue that the division brought forward. But there was no deliberative process. It would be you bring an issue in front of them and have one meeting and, and you might have, if it's a contentious meeting, uh, contentious issue, you might have 200, 300, 600 people there and you're trying to, to get input from the emotional the emotional um, uh, situation, and so uh, which is very hard. So you're trying to figure out what is the right thing to do th through the emotion, and so we just needed a new process, and so and we was able to um, create that, and so with the commission's help and the division's help, because they gave me um, the director uh, gave me um, uh, an open ticket. He said, "Go and do the Fisheries Reform Act." So. Uh, uh, we did, and it was very, very exciting. Looking back over it now, it's amazing uh, how much was able to be done. Because I'd go to 120 some meetings a year, and I just thank the Lord that uh, my wife was uh, understanding enough, and that uh, I loved what I did, and I loved working for the people of the state, and loved trying to make things better. And uh, she was understanding, and so we're, we're still luckily married, uh, <laughs> blessfully married uh, to this day. And uh, and so, it, and it went like that from 1977 till the day I retired uh, in 19, uh, in, in 2006. Okay. It was, uh, it was hundreds of meetings a year and uh, met great people. I remember Bob looking me in the eye and saying, you know, I was hesitant about all the time and the travel. And uh, he said, just think about all the amazing people that you'll meet. And he was right. And, and then he said, just think about all the good you can do. And uh, I don't know about all the good, but uh, uh, we had the opportunity. And so, uh, and I feel good about uh, what those commission members did, the public service they provided to the state, and feel good about those advisors, uh, the time they provided to our state. And uh, I feel great about my career. I feel like I gave something back to the citizens and to, uh, uh, to my family, uh, you know, which is, is such a wonderful state. Yeah, and you just inspired me to interject that, Jess, you were the recipient of the Governor's Longleaf Award. Am yep. I saying that correctly? The Longleaf, Longleaf Pine Award. The Longleaf Pine yep. Award. So yep. that's really something. Yep, and then I had citizens that, and that didn't come from the division. That came from citizens. Uh, usually the division will recommend that, and it's not meant to be derogative of the division, but that came from citizens that I'd met, and they also uh, nominated me to be Conservationist of the Year, and I got Conservationist of the Year by the Wildlife Federation. So, yeah. Bob, was it, you meet just some amazing people. Now, don't get me wrong, you meet some people that aren't very nice and and uh, try to intimidate you or use their their money or influence to steer things in a way, so you, you get to see the bad side of people, but you also get to see the wonderful side. And, and then when things are um, done, where people might have faith in their government is so rewarding. Yeah. Yep. Well, and I've also noticed, you know, having been involved in, on the commission and, and whatnot, and fisheries, politics, I've often noted that some people who get into marine science probably find themselves having to deal with people more than they thought they ever would have to when they entered grad school. <laughs> you know, some people just don't have the people skills. That's very true, Barbara. In fact, I saw a transition from when I was hired. You know, I, I thank the, the Lord that the director at the time, Connell Purvis, recognized that I had a, a, a good work ethic, that I was 
hopefully he thought I was honest, and I, I do believe I try to be as honest and, and have integrity as often as I can, and that I would work hard, but my scientific skills, you know, there were people that were a lot smarter, and still, that's the case, but he wanted people, he wanted staff that would go out and meet with fishermen, meet with uh, environmental people, and that was, I enjoyed that part. And uh, as I stayed with the division th for 30 years, they hired a lot of talented people, very, very, very smart, but they did not enjoy going out talking to people. And uh, that is uh, a deficiency. I'm, I'm fortunate now that I'm able to um, teach. I've been, had to, been uh, blessed to be able to teach at Duke Marine Lab, Marine Fisheries Ecology, how we, how we conserve, how our country or how our state uh, conserves marine resources, and then I was able, the last two years, I've been teaching at NC State, the marine lab down here, and what I strive to tell those students are the things that I had to learn the hard way or that my parents had taught me or through leaders that I admire is everything's a judgment call. Like Orbach, uh, Mike Orbach, who was on the mor moratorium steering, he said, every time you make a decision, it's a trade-off, and I agree with that 100%. Very, very seldom are things certain. You have, to, uh, you have to decide what is the likelihood of, uh, of uh, that being right, because science is not certain, and only a, a very arrogant person indicates that it is certain, especially in the fish world, fish that come and move, and, and they're under the water. And, uh, and then you have to make a judgment about that science. And so the judgment then has nothing to do with science. It's just whether it's right, is it wrong, is it just, is it unjust? And, uh, and that's where the social aspects come from. And I wasn't trained in that. I learned a lot from people like you and from people like Orbach and people at ECU. That were, they had a lot of anthropologists there that I'd listen to. And, uh, and then you just learn, you watch leadership skills from people that, that were judges on our advisory committees that judge whether people live or die. And so you watch their character and you watch how they make decisions. And you, you know, I'm, I'm a good um, leech. So you try to... Uh, uh, take some of those qualities and put them into your uh, portfolio and, and hopefully that makes you uh, uh, grow as a, as a person to make better decisions. So you're right and, and you see different commissioners, you know, um, uh, we had commissioners that sometimes before they reorganize they fall asleep during the meeting and, uh, and or they read the paper or uh, while the meeting's going on when you're deciding whether to allow someone to fish or not fish and uh, uh, you know that was that is not good leadership. At all. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you have some stories you could tell. Yeah, you and I have talked many times about putting a book together, and, uh, yeah. and there are some good stories that I, I won't repeat for the public. <laughs> but, you know, you do have exceptional people skills, and I've seen you in action, and I've seen some very heated meetings and advisory committee meetings where you just had a knack for kind of bringing the energy down and diffusing what could have become, you know, difficult or ugly. So if you were talking to a fresh-faced young person getting ready to, you know, enter the world of fisheries management, what advice would you give them regarding people skills in dealing with conflicts between stakeholders and meetings and, and that sort of situation? Well, one is always present yourself in humility. Don't act like you know everything, even though, and scientifically, you might know more than what the, the lay person uh, does know in terms of um, how to conserve that fish and what tools are used to conserve it. But uh, one, be humble, and two, listen before you speak. So learn to listen, and that just comes with age, as, as you and I probably know. Is that I, I don't know what the term would be in a sociological sense, but listen. And, and then care, try to care. Don't, don't become so hard-hearted uh, or cold-hearted that uh, you don't care, because if you don't care and you're a public servant, you work for the taxpayers, I don't know how you can do your job. And then if you're in the university and you're trying to learn and you don't care, I don't know how you can learn, uh, because you're learning, the learning is a facade. And so, uh, so I, that's the key thing, hum humility and listen, and uh, uh, those are two strong uh, attributes. And now if you're a public servant, you're working for the government, is any bit of progress is good. I've also learned that. So if you can get agreement, 
not even a concession, just agreement on some contentious issue, that is good, even if nothing can be done, even if nothing is done about it. So you measure progress. Many days I'd go home, and I'm, uh, you know, my stomach's churning. I, I, I want to take the baseball bat outside, hit a tree. You try to think back, and you think about it was was there progress, and if there was a, just an inch of progress, that was still progress. It was a good day, and so because a lot of my peers, they ended up leaving because they could not accept the slow pace of things. And that frustrates a lot of people like, uh, you know, Bob Lucas uh, and I'm sure Jewel Wheatley. They're very decisive men and they were, they're leaders of their companies and you make a decision, they go with it. So when somebody comes from a business that they own, the state um, system is very, um, can be very, very, very frustrating. So if you're coming in as a young biologist, and you go, well, why can't we do this? And you have to put it in the context. And again, if you put it in the context of there was a progress made forward, then that was a good day. Wow. That's great. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Because uh, younger people tend to be less patient than, uh, than us that are, uh, have gray hair. At least I have gray hair in my head. And so, and then, uh, you know, they're training the people a lot better, Barbara, that, you know, the, 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 in terms of technical skills and how to monitor natural resources and so uh, they're getting more technical training and statistics and math and you know a lot of it is turned away from um it's, it's mainly more, it's more empirical information and so you know with your background and and the federal government has recognized they're trying to do better with that uh the state unfortunately uh in recent years have moved away from some of that mm -hmm. yeah. so do you think the fisheries reform act has worked Yes, it worked. Uh, it worked, I think, very well. And I, I, I'm supposed to be humble, but I, I think it worked very well uh, up until, um, you know, the late uh, 2000s. And, uh, uh, and that's where the leadership comes in. You have to have a strong chairman. And uh, the chairman usually comes and goes with the governor, because the governor appoints all the members of the commission and also uh, the leadership, uh, you know, changes with the directors. And, uh, the last director I worked for, Preston Pape, was probably the smartest director that I, I had uh, worked with in terms of intelligence. And uh, uh, he was, uh, when he told people that this is what was going to, they were going to try to do, that was what was going to be tried to be done. And so, and he also gave me complete freedom to help with the commission because he realized how much it took. Um, it was a, it allowed him to focus on things that with the division and also federal agencies. And so, uh, so as leadership changed, uh, the situation changed, and here in recent years, I don't think the Fisheries Reform Act has been, uh, it's not fulfilling what its visionaries uh, had intended it to be. So what changed? Uh, the the uh, leadership at the division convinced the General Assembly to eliminate uh, a fair amount of the advisory committees. And there was always a, a paradox in with the division, some people didn't want to go to meetings, just like you talked about. People don't, do not, um, some people do not like to converse with people in intense situations. And so, uh, so these people work, you know, usually an eight hour day uh, uh, during the day, then they have to go to a meeting where they didn't, a lot of people didn't like that in the division. And, uh, and so, uh, and it costs a little bit of money that they used, now they used the money as the main reason for decreasing it because our state was going through budgetary uh, tough budgetary times, but most of the people when I worked with them, they had been willing to go to a meeting uh, without getting paid, and they were paid only fourteen dollars a night, uh, and so it's uh, you know not 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 to belittle that amount, but uh, they would serve the state as an advisor even if you didn't pay them anything. So that was a facade. That was not true, and so they eliminated a lot of the advisor committees. The commission quit utilizing the advisor committees on advice unless they were have to. Uh, the committee, the committees quit, meeting, quit meeting frequently to try to be progressive and proactive on dealing with issues. They became reactive, so they only would meet when the um, the um, uh, division had an issue or the commission had an issue that they wanted advice uh, for or were made to have advice for. Because uh, FMPs, the statute still required that the that the uh, uh, regional committees have to review an FMP, a fishery management plan, which was a uh, a planning document that was mandated by the Fisheries Reform Act, which brings the science 
all the science we know about a species in one document, and then it talks about the management and conservation policy and the recommendations for that. So, uh, uh, so I think the FMP advisory committees, there are, there are also um, advisory committees set up to work specifically on a fishery management plan. I think those are still functioning okay because uh, they're mandated by law, but the other committee structure is pretty much um, um, not being utilized nearly as much as it was when it was first set up. And then the commission, uh, it's not required that they listen to the advisory committees because it is just advice. But when, in, when I would talk to commissioners, you know, I, uh, I strive very hard to make sure they give that due consideration, that they make sure that they l read that, those memos, or that I'll be glad to recite to them what the advisory committees did, but they give that consideration so those people don't think they wasted their time. And in fact, we used to try to get the regional committee co-chairs and the standing committee co-chairs to come and give the reports. And of course, it's a difficult setting for them because they're usually fishermen, uh, a scientist would be more, at, be, be more at ease doing that, but a fisherman would get in front of that body and explain to them what his or her committee did. So uh, uh, sometimes they weren't real happy with that. But um, who, who wasn't real happy with that? So, sometimes the advisory, the advisory chairs wouldn't be happy with having to give a report in front of nine people and lawyers and the director and and so they were nervous and uh yeah, and, it was kind uh, of and an that, intimidating yeah it's intimidating and then yeah. trying to recall what they did and so i'd, I'd do the minutes and so um you know my staff would do the minutes and so uh, uh so anyway so that's that's a lot of that and then the commission the current commissions uh um they are moving forward on issues without even consulting advisory committees and they have the power to do so but that was not clearly not the intent of the fishery reform act so clearly and we had a big debate uh, when the, during the moratorium steering committee as to who should point the commissioners. And right now, that power lies solely with the governor. And there was a, a debate, a serious debate, if you remember, about should we give, should there be three members from the senator pro tem and three members from the speaker of the house, and three members from the from the um, uh, from the governor. And Governor Hunt at the time said that he he cared about our fisheries and he's willing to bear that sole responsibility. So he was willing to accept that. And he, uh, you know, people might. I agree to disagree that uh, that the members were not good members, but I tell you, all those members went to the meetings, all those members were engaged, and all those members uh, 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 wanted to be involved in the process. So I might disagree with the way they did it, but I'd tell you that every one of them, even if I disagree with their position, they were involved. And I also remember the, a huge emphasis on balance and, you know, what, what should the makeup of the commission be? And so do you think our, our, do you think that's worked? Is it uh, the current commission makeup is not balanced. So people have been put in at-large slots that uh, seem to um, be, to seem to favor consistently or be aggressive in and not being um, middle of the road. And so, and then it's very difficult to find commercial fishermen that can afford to come to the meetings. Uh, and that, uh, and so there's one commercial, uh, two commercial fishermen and one in the, uh, that's involved in industry. So it's more, it's easier to find a dealer that runs the business that can represent the, uh, the, the business aspects but it's very hard to find commercial fishermen that need to be on the water being willing to take um, the time to come to the meetings uh, to represent that aspect. And so I don't see the balance. The science, the scientist was meant to be, um, you know, a person that was uh, take the numbers and look at the, what they know about the animal or the fish and help, help the commission um, determine that and I do not see that happening now and so uh, um, uh, uh, and that's unfortunate yeah so there's, there's discussions going on now about you know doing away with the commission because back when we had moratorium steering committees uh, when we you know some states uh, do not have commissions they do it strictly through the political route of the General Assembly some uh, uh, where the General Assembly will give the director executive power and uh, uh, I thought this was, as did the moratorium steering committee, that this was a balance. So you have a division and a division director that would recommend things to a citizen body. The citizen body would not be so large 
it would be nine people and they would represent various user groups they would they would um, uh, perform a balanced and a due diligence duty to take the information and uh, make the best decisions for our state and uh, uh, I do not see that happening in uh, unfortunately in the in recent years recent years and that's why you see in, in my opinion that's why you see a lot of the intensity mainly between recreational and commercial fishermen and it's not all recreational fishing because I'm a recreational fisherman even though some people say that I, I am not uh, that is my main hobby and I don't see the consumer and I don't see the uh, regular recreational fishermen getting a lot of representation from the current uh, commission makeup what do you mean by regular recreational fishermen somebody likes to catch that goes out and catch fish on their own they like to eat some of the fish that they like to catch. So As like opposed to what kind of recreational fish? Someone that might come down and, and pay a charter boat captain uh, inshore to go catch a red drum or to catch a speckled trout or to catch an albacore. And so, uh, or they come down on the weekend and, and, um, um, and they, you know, they, they're good. Some of them are good at what they do, but, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, you have a whole, whole lot of people like fish for spot with two hook bottom rigs and, uh, and they love to catch and they love to catch and eat those fish. And, and uh, um, I don't see a lot of representation from those, uh, for those people in the last four years uh, of deliberations by the commission. And, and then in the consumer, the same thing. You know, we have 10 million people in our state, and there's not a lot of discussion by the commission about providing a seafood product to consumers. Even though there's only 5,000 or so commercial fishermen that are, at, that are licensed, um, you don't hear the commission talk about the role of the fishermen of providing uh, a product to people that don't have a boat to fish, catch fish with a hook or a line and bring it back, or uh, can't afford to pay someone mm -hmm. to do to do that, and so uh, and that's probably you know there's 1.8 million recreational anglers they think so that's nine million people that are consumers, which is uh, the majority by far the you know 90 percent of our population. So you don't hear the commission talk about that at all, at all about bringing a product, except sometimes from the commercial members. Mm -hmm. So do you yeah so you could say that could be like a food security issue, right? Or a food or a consumer issue or... Well, it's definitely a consumer issue and it's also a health issue because okay. eating seafood is good for you. It's, uh, uh, it's a, also a, um, a uh, domestic issue in the sense of, you know, uh, I would prefer to eat a local seafood product than a product that comes from abroad. You know, we're the second highest consumer of seafood in the world. We're the most affluential society that consumes seafood in the world. And, uh, and 90, 80, 90% of our seafood's imported. So it doesn't make sense to me when you have a product here that people, uh, that we know how they're caught, they're supposed to be managed for sustainability. If they're raised in a farm somewhere, we know what kind of uh, chemicals are used to uh, feed those fish, to help those fish grow while uh, if they're raised abroad, uh, you do not know that. So if I'm a, 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 a person that is in, in charge of like commerce, I would prefer to uh, have um, fish that's provided here locally. You know, plus you, what, are you, what you're providing to um, the local economy. Because most of our fishermen are small business people. They're not giant corporations. And so they contribute to their uh, uh, communities economically and I don't know much about economics but I just know that they do they buy their stuff locally if they can here and the same thing with the regular recreational fisherman that I mean he uh, he comes down and brings his boat or he buys a little boat here and he'll go out fishing whenever he can and brings his fish back to, to eat with his family or he provides it to his church mm -hmm. or his uh, civic group for fish fries and that's what I call the regular recreational fisherman okay mm -hmm. So, Jess, what would you like to see happen moving forward in the way we manage our fisheries in North Carolina? I'd love to see the emphasis where, you know, um, uh, the leadership of our state reemphasize the, uh, the advisory committees. It re they aren't costly. Uh, they are a burden to the staff. And if, if the, the staff of the Division of Marine Fisheries, then they need more staff, then maybe um, the, the General Assembly could provide that. But I... I uh, for many years, I did it with the staff that they have now. So uh, um, it is doable, and uh, um, I'd like to see that reformulated. And, and 
uh, have four regional, our, our state is way too diverse to have two regional advisory committees. So they have a north and a south, and then they, the folks that are inland, which there are a lot of recreational fishermen inland, there, there are some people that come down here on the weekends to fish commercially, they have a commercial license. But by far, we have tremendous numbers of recreational fishermen inland. They need to be represented and not have to go to a meeting in Wilmington or Moorhead when they're in the Ashboro, Greensboro, Burlington area. So they need to have, they need to reinstitute those committees. So they have four regional committees. And our state is so long uh, coastal-wise. I mean, you go from uh, Knott's Island to Calabash, it'll take you almost a day. So, uh, so uh, and these are people that are volunteering their time. And then I would... Um, uh, make those active again. I would require if the, the chairman could do that. Uh, he could say you will meet in between each commission meeting. They need to have their water quality and habitat committee meeting. Uh, they haven't met in, long, in a long, long, long time. And this, this commission is one of the few commissions that has the ability to comment on permits for the state. Uh, it is the only commission that has the ability to comment on permits uh, uh, for the state. And so they have chose not to utilize that, that uh, authority. And, uh, and they are not meeting, and they're not discussing what habitat and water quality. And for example, uh, you know, spotted sea trout, the division felt it was all due to overfishing, and, and with the new science from NC State, they felt that natural mortality, i.e. what is going on in the water that would happen naturally is affecting the population a lot more than what fishing is doing. So you need to have a habitat and water quality. You know, what has happened to our river herring? They, they've been, uh, uh, a moratorium on fishing was placed on that fish in 2000 and have yet to come back. So, you know, is it habitat, is it water quality, is it fishing in northeastern states? Uh, we don't know. We do not know, but we do know you still cannot fish for a river herring. And, and that is a, uh, uh, one of our, and it's sad. And so something needs to be moving in the right direction. Again, recognizing it's the government, but there's no movement on that. There is none, except from a federal level, and that's sad. The federal government is pursuing, and it used to be the structure we had, our system that we had here was more progressive than what the federal government has. Now, the federal government system is more progressive than what the state has. Our, our, our state was looked upon as a system to replicate, and if I was another state now, I would not want to replicate what we're doing here. We're, going, we're following examples like with you know, game fish, banning this gear, banning that gear, um, l further limiting effort when uh, they're not even looking at data as to the fishing capacity. So there's people that want to redefine uh, like commercial fishermen and, and, and what is the evidence that there needs to be a, uh, a, a um, reduction in fishing capacity. I don't think even looked at that. You know, so, and there's people out there, I'm not the expertise, but there's people out there that could help them with that to have a objective discussion of that, just like the moratorium steering committee did. And so, uh, uh, and so I, I would say, you know, I would not look at North Carolina as to how they're doing things. Uh, I would look to other states or the federal government. The federal government is having town hall meetings where they discuss things, open forums. Another thing I neglected is, you know, when you have a meeting, you limit people to two minutes or three minutes of discussion. That is not good government policy, period. Because these people pay your salary, these people uh, uh, have empowered you to manage that, and, and we had none of that when I was working with uh, uh, the uh, commission. None of that. And so, uh, um, now there doesn't need to be limits, but you know, these people, it's their resource, it's a public trust resource, and it's just that we're blessed, to, or at least I used to be blessed to be able to try to, to manage that for them. Yeah, so people could more or less say their piece. They didn't have to stay to this little time limit that they Exactly had right. Yeah. In fact, uh, Lu uh, Lucas, the chairman, said, well, let's have a meeting the night before the commission meeting where people can come and just talk to us, like a town hall, like what our president does with town halls or candidates do or like other states do, like the federal government does. They have an open webinar, web webinar, and, and so they... Uh, uh, they come in and just talk about issues, not in a, in a uh, what is on your mind. And there has to be some limit on that, of course, but the chair of the meeting can handle that if they're, if they're properly trained in uh, parliamentary procedures. You know, and, and, so, and usually people are respectful. If you talk to them respectfully, you say, well, you know, we need to move on. They recognize that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's much like church, you know. So, uh, yeah. And so you can go, well, just we need to move on. And most people, when you do it kindly and, uh, and humbly, they will move on. And... Uh, but limiting them to two to three minutes for the sake of the convenience of the people that are 
have the privilege of serving the people, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And, and they do that in a formal public hearing, I can understand that. But, you know, you need to have opportunity where you try to get input. And with the lessening of the committee meetings, uh, that's even more important. Can, you know, how do people access their government to give input? And, uh, and there's two minutes, three minutes. So uh, I don't think that's uh, very responsible. So do you think it's a matter of the leadership in fisheries just kind of taking the path of least resistance, you know, because it's just easier? Well, sometimes it's, it appears it might be least resistance. Uh, it's um, whatever's the easiest. Yeah. The easiest in terms, it's not the, it's, it's like the minimal, the minimal you need to do to, um, to do what you're required to do or what you're politically required to do by statute or required to do by um, uh, uh, tradition. And, and then um, I think that is some of it because like the advisory committees meeting only when they have issues and they put four issues on their agenda that are all contentious and people will have working for a living whatever their job is, whether they're, they're recreational fishermen and they have a job and they come and they stay till 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, that is not a responsible government. You know, so you should have right. two meetings and, and meet. And so, um, and so why that is, I'm not privy to that anymore, but I know it's not good for our state. I can say that emphatically, it is not good. And in our fisheries, if you had a small coastline like Georgia, where you had not very diverse fisheries like, uh, um, uh, I guess it's hard to find a, you know, example that if you just worked on shrimp, uh, uh, then you maybe could do it that way. But our fisheries are gr very diverse. The fishermen are diverse. Uh, user groups within the user groups are diverse, just like we talked about our recreational fishermen. You have people that spend thousands of dollars a day to go out and catch mai mai. That you have people that spend hundreds of dollars a day that pay people to catch them catch red drum. Then you have people that have a 14 foot uh, 20 horse motor, uh, outboard motor on a boat. They're going out trying to catch sea mullet in, in, in spot. And even the same thing with the commercial fishermen. I mean, you got the small gill netter, you got a small oysterman, you've got the uh, small shrimp trawls, you've got channel netters. So the diversity, uh, to me, uh, uh, requires that uh, you have to have frequent opportunities for input. Because a lot of times you, you don't have agreement on the issues. So that's not even, even before you get into the issue. That's just the, 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 the framework of where we live. You know, so then once you get to the issue, it even gets more complicated. You know, should you have, uh, what should be a, a crab pot limit be? Do you need a crab pot limit? And that you'll get a whole an array of answers from, again, from Currituck to uh, Sh the Shalote River. So I asked you what you would like to see happen going ahead. What do you think is actually happening or, you know, where do you think we'll be, say, 20 years from now in our fisheries management and in the health of our resources and fisheries? Unless things change uh, and there is strong leadership and uh, our General Assembly and or our governors uh, be make this a focus, um, we will be apt to lose a lot of our commercial fisheries because of the power of um, of uh, money and the power they will, they will be, and the power of numbers. And so, and to me, that's very sad if it's not scientifically shown that you need to reduce fishing for a fish commercially. Uh, if the science shows that, I'm I'm willing to make uh, I would be willing to make a hard decision. So, uh, the science is pretty good. The science should get better. The leadership will determine how they use that science. So if you have good leaders, you will extend the time and you still might have uh, fisheries where people catch fish to provide to consumers. I also, I, I, I do see hope in these, um, where the catch groups try to educate the consumer. And I see more of that at universities. I see more of that in the medical field. I see more of that in the retail the food business for people, there's a movement towards local. And I see that as the main hope for uh, commercial fisheries throughout the country. Because as I mentioned earlier, I would not want to buy imported seafood uh, uh, unless I had to. What do you mean you see that in the medical community? 
uh, people are saying it's good to eat fish. Mm, okay, and so, uh, you know, we know science indicates, uh, you know, the, the, the most science, and again, I'm not a nutritionist, but they, the benefits of eating uh, fish that provide omega-3s outweigh eating fish that might have chemicals in them. You know, so there were big mercury scares earlier and earlier 20 years ago, and there's still NGOs or non-governmental agencies that still say you shouldn't eat uh, fish uh, uh, in any certain amount because it might have mercury, and they have these advisory committees, advisories that are put out, but most of the medical community indicate that, um, uh, you know, as long as you eat it in a reasonable situation and you're not uh, immune suppressed, it's good for you. So most of what I read and see uh, you know, uh, and hear is that you know eating fish is good for you and it will keep your uh, heart pumping and, and uh, uh, help keep your body strong. So, uh, so I see the health group, you know, uh, health field actually getting involved in that, you know, uh, and, uh, and so that is uh, looking down the road. I see that as a potential and as the universities and, the, um, and these different consumer groups, uh, if they stay focused on that, that will help. Um, otherwise, it'll be very difficult for uh, um, the commercial fisheries because there'll be people that will, uh, for example, right now a lot of people do not like gill nets in our state. So uh, gill nets uh, uh, will be talked about unless a, a, a strong leadership occurs and, uh, and education, strong education occurs as to the positive and negatives of that. And the same thing with trawling. So shrimp trawling, you know, we shrimp trawling is one of our biggest, um, uh, most valuable economic fisheries. However, they do catch small fish. And during my career in a division, rather than argue about how many small fish they catch, we decided to work with fishermen to maximize the reduction of small fish uh, in the shrimp catches. And so we were the first state to require fin fish excluders. And they do work. And here recently, I'm uh, um, encouraged that the, there's been more research and they've actually increased the efficiencies of those. And, uh, and so that's the kind of things, if those continue to happen, uh, then, then I see the future having commercial fisheries in our state. And, 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 and we, will, we will see more of an emphasis on um, um, farm-raised shellfish because that is an economic opportunity. So, uh, and, and as long as we keep our water clean, that's why, that's why it's important to have a habitat and water quality committee because shellfish are very susceptible to bad water quality. And uh, you'll see that grow because people love to eat oysters and clams. And, uh, um, and uh, hopefully our other fisheries will also be able to uh, keep going. It won't be due to usually to the lack of sustainability because we have a, uh, if our leaders are responsible, we have the science to try to determine sustainability. The federal government is mandated, so you, you'll see fish species uh, that are caught from three miles offshore. Uh, they will hopefully uh, continue to rebound or continue to not be overfished, and hopefully you'll see that in our state too, because all the fishery management plans that we've done are supposed to uh, uh, stop overfishing and to remove a fish from the overfish status. So that there's hope on that, but uh, um, the politics of money and greed are, are very strong. Do you see any hope in bringing commercial and recreational fishermen together as allies, as as opposed to <laughs> being on you know opposite in opposite foxholes as they seem to be so often? Yes, because uh, the regular recreational fishermen, um, they are generally supportive of people that want to go out and catch fish to sell. Uh, and so there are problems, but it's, it's not the extreme, uh, as what the extreme recreational fishermen would uh, convey. Just like you have extreme commercial fishermen that say that they need to catch all anytime they want and don't put any restriction on these. Now, I don't run into those as much anymore. I used to run those uh, in my career, but the people I talk to now are willing to accept a reasonable management measures that allow them that keep the resource they're trying to catch sustainable because it's in their benefit from a business standpoint, even if they didn't have any stewardship ethic. But most of them do have a stewardship ethic because they realize that if they don't, they might not be able to work next week or next year or five years from now. So there's, 
to me, they have a, a, a lot of the commercial fishermen I know have a stewardship ethic. Same thing with a recreational fisherman. The regular recreational fisherman has that because he or she will want to come catch those fish. Now, there are people that are really, really vocal advocates on the Internet and in, and in media that uh, say that, that fish should be for only one user group and fish should be uh, for, uh, uh, only for a certain use. The Fishery Reform Act was modified to allow what's called a supplement to the fisheries management plans. And personally, I do not feel that's necessary. That's supposed to be a quick fix, temporary thing. And, and I would, uh, if you're going to have a supplement, you still need to mandate, the statute still need to mandate input somehow. It might be quicker and expedited if it is an emergency. But, uh, and I'd have stronger standards because right now the only standard is uh, that the secretary signs off on it. It doesn't require the executive leaders to present to the secretary information as to why the long-term viability of a fish is, is, uh, is threatened or is needed for the supplement because that's such a big, big issue. And so right now, based on what I've seen on the uses of supplements, uh, I would not, that is not in the best interest of our state uh, to have that. Uh, and so uh, the commission can act quickly if they need to uh, on some things, uh, or the director usually has proclamation authority that the commission could um, uh, have an emergency meeting. And, and if something has, like all the pinfish died or whatever, that they needed to do something to stop pinfish harvest. So. Yeah, and there have been a, a, cup of, a few cases in the past where the commercial fishing industry has, has filed a lawsuit against either the state or the federal government. That's correct. Um, based on, you know, their their belief that a, a fishery was not properly managed. Well, usually it was based on the science, like the three the three that I were involved I was involved with um, where the division okay. where the division uh, actually joined in with the lawsuits with the commercial fishing groups and uh, it was against the federal government over the misuse or the lack of science. And so, uh, so we were successful in all three of those cases. And uh, we've threatened lawsuits the state has with other states where they wouldn't allow us to ship fish into those. And it, in effect, it uh, affected the, the, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. So we, again, we got the governors involved and, and they were able to resolve it, uh, even though the fisheries leaders of from the other states weren't, a, weren't willing to work with uh, North Carolina. The most recent one that I've been involved with is the use of, um, um, is the, uh, involved Southern Flounder, and it was the use of the supplement authority by the commission uh, to put uh, very stringent measures on Southern Flounder fisheries in our state. And uh, recently uh, a judge, just in fact just yesterday, a judge found that the commission had acted in a uh, arbitrary and capricious manner and uh, is allowing a, a temporary restraining order He's allowing that to continue uh, through this fishing season, which is very, very, very unusual um, uh, that the, the commission was found uh, to be arbitrary and capricious uh, in performing their duties uh, towards. Uh, and it, my experience with that is that they, uh, the science wasn't properly conveyed to the commission and the commission did not seek that science and the commission chose to uh, only utilize, to utilize selected aspects of the science that was available. Because there was a lot of data available to the commission to make the decisions. And then they rejected the um, division. The division did not provide a recommendation on the supplement, which, uh, you know, division you know, um, is the, they should be the experts for our state regarding uh, fisheries resources and stocks, uh, the biological status of stocks and um, the commission did not ask for a recommendation from them. They didn't provide one. And so uh, uh, if I was still, and I have had the privilege of serving on the commission, I would have asked for one from them because I would have wanted them to know what they felt. Even though I know my duties would have been separate from theirs, I still would have wanted to know what they thought, just like uh, uh, any reasonable person would. So was the argument that the state was not properly using data to manage the fishery, or was it that they weren't properly following the, the process, or was it a combination of both? Combination of both. It was mainly, the main issue was is that the, uh, um, they did not utilize, convey to the commission all the information that they had available, and that their interpretation of that, of that data uh, was not completely um, uh, forthright. 
And so, uh, and, uh, and then the commission didn't question that though. You know, some commissioners did, but the majority, um, uh, which was uh, usually a 6-2 or 6-3 vote, uh, when the commercial guys uh, and gals uh, voted against that, they decided to proceed. They decided to proceed on, and and then part of it is uh, not following the process. The supplement was meant to be a quick acting measure, a quick quick acting action based on one management issue. Uh, they could use various measures to implement that issue, but it, it, what they passed was a whole array of issues. If they if they use that to supplement the prior FMP, which is what they're supposed to do by law. And so they addressed issues such as ocean closures, such as gear modifications, such as sustaining the resource. Uh, uh, and so they, in fact, uh, in my opinion, passed an amendment, what would have been a substantial amendment to the plan as a supplement. And they didn't have any advisory committee input. They had one public meeting. Um, hundreds of people uh, attended. They had thousands of comments, which it looked like to me we went back to the old way of doing fisheries management in our state before we had the Fisheries Reform Act. And the nine commissioners, the majority of the commissioners had predetermined where they wanted to go because they put measures on board that they proposed. They, they were so bold to, to put measures about banning certain types of commercial gear as a temporary measure with, uh, with uh, uh, science that was inconclusive or not showing that. And I was just happy that a judge, a, a reasonable and, a, and a, uh, an objective person found that that was true, that it was, uh, didn't need to be the case. And so for the first time in my 40 years of working on these kind of issues, uh, uh, a judge intervened and, uh, and decided that the commission would, did not uh, responsibly fulfill its duties. And it's sad that it came to that. I mean, that's why it's very unfortunate uh, because of uh, that it, that it came to that it is it's doing it again jess okay so i'm just gonna end it there so thank you for your time is it all right yeah i appreciate Good. it